All right, let's jump, let's jump right in. So good. It's good to see so many familiar faces and folks I haven't seen for a while. So good. So good to be together. Mm. There goes my wife. Praise the Lord. Praise him, somebody. If you marry, you need to get to that marriage conference, I'm telling you what. I'm telling you, that's right, I'm telling you what, one of the best things I ever did for my marriage, me and Angela have been together, it'll be 22 years, October 1st, <laughs> had you scared for a second, girl, October 1st, it'll be 22 years, and uh, we, went to a marriage, we went to a marriage workshop while we were still living in Kansas City, and it was the best thing I did for my marriage, you know, it, hands down it was. And uh, me and Ange had been together at that time for about 18 years. And uh, just going to it, meeting other couples who were journeying through life and marriage just like we were. I'll tell you what, I didn't feel like, I felt, here's a, a positive way of saying it, I felt normal. I felt like I had a normal marriage. And then that empowered me to believe that I could have an extraordinary marriage. Because I saw we weren't so far off and that the Lord was with us and and so I'd encourage you to get to that. Um, if you take your, for lack of a better term, you take your car for a check-in every so many hundred miles, how much more so your marriage? Let somebody lift the hood up and see how, everything's, how everything's running. And so I just want to encourage this family. Or if you're engaged, I want you to come to that marriage as well. So get that information. And it's, a, it's a great $40 investment. You spend more than that on caramel macchiatos at Starbucks in a month anyway. So um, it'll help your waist and your heart coming to the marriage conference. All right, let me pray for us. We're going to get started. I'm excited about today. Father, we thank you. Yeah, we just, we are believing you for great things. God, you have so many amazing things in store for those who are called by your name. Father, you have so many amazing things in store for this city. Well, together as a church, we just, we believe that this city can be a city of hope. It can be a city of light. Father, we believe our homes and our hearts can be cities of light, cities of hope. God, I ask you that you would help me teach your word. God, I ask that you'd help us as your people hear your word, receive your word, and then by your grace, represent you well from the things we've heard and read from your word. We love you, Holy Spirit. You're always welcome here. You're always welcome here, Holy Spirit. We love you, God, and we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Before I get too started, too far in the sermon series, i got a few more housekeeping issues I want to bring up. Ones I'm really excited about, uh, and, and that's this. Um, I'm bringing it before my church family because I'm asking you all to pray for me. Uh, Tuesday, uh, by God's grace, weather withstanding, I'll be driving to Des Moines, Iowa, and for about three days, um, I'll be in Washington, D.C. Um, I'll be have the privilege to meet with some other uh, leaders, and uh, I'll be going to, every year they call it a, a presidential prayer breakfast, and so um, I'll have a chance to uh, have breakfast with Obama. Uh, it's not as cool as it sounds, because I talk to Jesus every day, one, and he's the king of everything, <laughs> and then two, I mean, God bless the president, but and then number two, um, I'll be in the room with about 5,000 world leaders, so it'll be me and some other world leaders, but here's what I'm asking you to pray. Pray that God set up divine appointments with some of these global leaders. I mean, literally, there will be princes and sheiks from Saudi Arabia. Last year, like him or not, the Dalai Lama was there, and the Prince of Jordan was supposed to come. And so there are some world leaders that will be there. I'm praying and believing that God has me there very strategically for a purpose. I believe this church has not just a local calling, but we have a national and a global mission. And I, to me, I just see God setting that up for us. So pray for me. Pray that I would know what to say and what not to say, that the Lord would just give me favor, and I would be able to go further faster as a result of being in that meeting, and as a result, as a church, we would go further, faster, as a result of me being in that meeting. One more piece of housekeeping is, is this. If you've given to Hope City Church, um, if you have not received an email from us or a letter in the mail, I've got about eight um, uh, names that don't have addresses on them. This is for last year. If you gave last year, then we have your giving information, and we need to get that to you ASAP so that you can um, do whatever you choose to do with it, whether it be get a tax write-off for it or just throw it away. But we need to make sure we get that to you. So um, after the service, please uh, see me um, sometime. All right? Y'all ready to dig in? I'm ready to 
with you again. I'm excited. But today we are in our final session in what initially started out as a five-part se- series on hope. As a church family, we've been looking at hope. And what we've said about this series is that as a church family, we've been wanting to learn how to experience hope and then express the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. Time and time again throughout this series, we've said that hope isn't a feeling or a philosophy, but hope at its core, at its heart, is a person. That means that today's message, if we hadn't preached it, then we would have fallen short of giving people the essence and the very heartbeat of what it means to know what hope is. Because hope, again, is a person, not a set of beliefs, not even a set of actions, but it's a person named Jesus who's full of hope and who gives hope to every heart that would receive him. So today I'm excited because we're talking about E, engaging others with the gospel of hope. A few weeks ago, one of the guys in our spiritual family who's pretty creative even created some stage art for us to kind of help us wrap our minds as well as our hearts and hopefully our hands and feet around this idea of experiencing hope and then giving it away. And so the first week, we looked at hospitality, how as a church family, we want to show hospitality, here it is, Hope City, to friends, neighbors, and strangers, That we want to be people like Jesus who saw Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree and said, hey Zacchaeus, I know you, I love you, I want you, and you're welcomed to be with me, and so I want to have dinner with you in your house. How there's many people, our friends, family members, co-workers, strangers that are just waiting for someone to say, hey, can we have a meal together? Can I get to know you better? We even looked at the idea that at the heart of the gospel message is this idea of hospitality. That Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, he says this, if any man hears my voice, if he opens the door of his heart to me, he says, my dad and I, we're going to come in and we're going to have dinner with him. We're going to have a meal with him. So at the heart of the gospel message is a God who's longing to make connection and have communion with us as his children. And when we, as God's children, open our hearts and our homes to other people, we're in some small way giving them a picture of what God desires to give them in the gospel. And it's this, you're welcome and you're wanted here. But hope doesn't end there in hospitality. Hope has an external dimension to it as well. And so the O in hope was offering to serve others in meaningful and impactful ways. And I just got to tell you this, Hope City Church, you do this so well. I am so proud of you. The way that you give yourself away, this city ain't got a prayer. As a matter of fact, it's going to get conquered because it's got a bunch of prayers. Just this last weekend, I didn't ask him if I could share it. I know he wouldn't mind. But we, uh, every Saturday morning, we have a men's group here, a men's breakfast called Men of Valor, and guys get together, and I love it because it's, it's raw, it's real. I mean, we're honest with one another. We call one another forward as men. We love one another. We raise the bar with one another. We pray together. We're in the work together, and one of our guys was missing, uh, nicknamed Gunny, is Bruce, Bruce Minor. And uh, Bruce texted me that morning. He said, hey, Q, I won't be at Men of Valor today. I went, okay. He says, because I'm going out and helping a, a woman move from a rough part of the community to another part of the community. My wife and I are going to go do that. My text back to him was, you're being a man of valor. Don't worry about missing the meeting called Men of Valor. And that's serving others in meaningful and impactful ways. Last week, one of my favorite subjects was amazing. I don't know about y'all, but I was blessed preaching it. I hope you was blessed hearing it. But we talked about prayer and how hope is vertical as well. And this idea that that which you pray for, you will grow to love. That which you pray for, you will grow to love. And this idea of not just praying for ourselves, but we looked at the Lord's Prayer and we talked about this acronym called PRAY, P-R-A-Y. And pray was, the P was praise and entering his course with thanksgiving. The R was turning to God in repentance and saying, God, I've blown it, I've failed, but you love me and you will help me be better. And then the A was advocating for ourselves and saying, God, I ask you to bless and keep and prosper and feel and not myself only, but those around me. And then why was, God, I yield to you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not my will. Your will be done. And all of that is amazing. And it's amazing when we just don't experience those things for ourselves. It's amazing when we express it to others. Oh, but Hope City Church family, 
without this one, this one that goes this way, this, this one that's moving us out the E, the engaging them with the gospel, then we fall short of giving them hope that sustains them, that will keep them in the midst of life's storms and everything is raging. If they don't have this anchor, I'm telling you, I've been in parts of my life where I didn't have Jesus, I didn't have that anchor, and it felt like I was going to capsize, like the ways of life, the worries of life, the anxieties of life were going to topple me. But now, praise be to God. Hebrews 6, 9 says this, we have this anchor, this sure and steadfast hope, Jesus. Jesus is a great hope for the heart. Today, my prayer is God would help me, help us learn how to express that hope to others around us by engaging them with his good news, his gospel of hope. Okay? If you've got a Bible, we'll be in Acts chapter 17. I'll give you a second to turn there if you want to. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we have some actually over there. Um, you can get, and it's yours if you don't have one, but... I'd actually, you not take it to beef up your Bible um, library. <laughs> if you're like me, I got about 10 of them with 10 different translations, and I was tempted to take one of those even though I've got an NIV, just because it's a Bible, and who doesn't like Bibles? And, um, but we invite you to have one. If not, the, the, um, the verses will be up on the screen. We're in Acts chapter 17, and, and here's the big idea today. Here's my prayer, is that we would see from the life of Paul, the apostle, um, what it means in practical ways that we can engage others around us with the hope of the gospel, that the gospel must be shown, but the gospel also must be shared, that the gospel is actually a message. And it's this, Father loves you. The Father has made a sacrifice for you. Come home. Son or daughter, come home. Papa's not mad, come home. And I want to help us know how to do that, how to share that. If you're here today and you've not heard, Papa loves you. He's not mad at you. Come on home. If you thought that the father was mad and angry and pushed you away and shoved you away, then I've got good news. You can come home. You can come home. Father loves you. The father not only sees who you are, but he sees who you will be. Don't let your present circumstances keep you from a great future with God. Acts 17. What did Paul do? What can we learn? Let's, let's dive in. We're going to look at this pretty much line by line like we did last week. We are a Bible-centered church. The Bible governs what we say, what we do, what we believe by God's grace. And so we're going to be in the Bible today because we believe the Bible came from God and it's for us to learn how to live for God and how to live a life that's pleasing to him. So Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 16, we're going to read all the way through, all the way down to verse 31. Paul, or, or excuse me, Luke writes this. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, the, his spirit was provoked within him. As he was, excuse me, as he saw the city was full of idols. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler have to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. They said this because Paul was preaching Jesus and his resurrection. Verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Epigorean, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Epigorean, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot at periods and the boundaries of their dwellings that they should seek him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, praise God for Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. I'll keep reading just a little bit. Now, they, now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysus, the whatever that is, and a woman named Demarius and others with him. Sometimes I think these folks was black with the names they have. <laughs> Praise him. <laughs> Praise him. I got a name like Pavadis, I can say that. Um, <laughs> my name is actually Latin, so it could have been in the book. Um, uh, so here's the, here's the big idea, Hope City. Let's kind of work through some of what Paul's saying here. Um, a little bit of a backdrop. Paul starts off in verse seven, 16 with this phrase. He says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Antioch, the spirit, or his spirit, was provoked within him as he saw that city was full of idols. The context of what's happening here, if you read over a few more verses, Paul has just left Berea in the area of Thessalonica, which is where the book of Thessalonians come from. And he had been preaching the gospel and persecution began to arise because they didn't want to hear about Jesus. Like even today, people will let you talk about God and love. But the moment you say, Jesus, there's a shift in the conversation. And for Paul, that's what happened. Paul was there talking about Jesus. And there was a, a mighty persecution that happened. And so the, the church said, Paul, you got to get out of here. So Paul travels over to Athens, which is just a journey away. And he leaves in Berea, Timothy and Silas. But when Paul gets to Athens, he says, I'm here all by myself. I'm in a new city and I would like to have my friends with me. And so Paul calls for Timothy and Silas to join him. Here's the point. Why are you saying this, Pastor Q? Paul, in his missionary journey, those who know the life of Paul, Paul went from city to city, country to country, to strategically to preach the gospel, to set up churches, to set up elders to establish God's kingdom here on the earth. And the point I'm making is that Paul didn't go to Athens with the express intention of planting a church. He was just waiting there, kind of like I'll wait for my wife in the parking lot while she's in the mall. <laughs> Paul's just waiting there. That, that's, a, that's very important for us as a church family. See, because here's what I believe. I believe that if we're going to engage the world with the gospel, it's got to be more than the two strategic outreaches that we do as a church family. We've got to learn to be like Paul and like Paul while Paul was waiting there. He said, hmm. Paul actually sees, we see four things happen in the life of Paul that we're going to talk about a little bit that I think are critical for us to catch so then we can go out and can become contagious in the way that we live. See, the thing I love about Paul is that Paul was a man who lived on mission. Paul was a man who just sat in the daily activities of life and said, God, what are you up to and how can I join you? So looking at Paul, the first thing we see is that in verse 16, it says, while Paul was, was waiting. 
while Paul is just sitting there waiting. And here's what I believe is that Paul understood this. God is always on the move. Therefore, Paul was always on mission. Hope City Church, I want you to get this in your, in your, in your construct, just in your worldview. Listen, the Father is always working. The Father is always moving. The Father is always active. We never have to wonder, is God working in the life of a person? The answer is always yes. And because the answer is always yes, we can always know that God is going to meet us where we're at, no matter how the result turns out. Because the Father is a good Father. The Father's always reaching for his sons and daughters who have walked away from home and saying, come back home. I love you. I'm not mad at you. And like any good father, he knows how to recruit his children to go and get their brother and sister. Parents say amen. amen. When I'm in the living room and I want something from my daughter who's in her bedroom, I go get my son and say, son... Do me a favor. Do you love your daddy? Yeah. Go tell your sister to come here. That's, that's what we have the chance to do. The father said, Blake, go tell my son to come home. I want you to tell him. He'll listen to you. We've got close family members and friends who, who we know, who we love, who maybe even at one point in time knew, loved, and followed Jesus that, that aren't anymore. And, but, but the Lord strategically placed you close to them. And I wonder what would happen if you or I just said to them, hey, come, come to this new place with me. Or, hey, can we pray together sometime? And I'll do the praying. You don't have to say anything. See, Paul understood that the Father was always working. So even while Paul was waiting, Paul got out and got about the Father's, the father's mission. It doesn't end there. If you keep reading here, it says not only did Paul wait. I like this line right here. He says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was pro provoked within him. Have, have you ever, the thing I love about Paul here is that Paul hearts, it, it, it gets pricked, his, his, his heart gets, gets um, poked, and his heart gets provoked, and that, that provoking, it moves Paul, or it propels Paul into action, and I don't know about you, but have you ever seen injustice that's provoked your heart, or maybe it's been compassion that's pricked your heart? Uh, just a couple of days ago, I was at Fairway buying some eggs and bacon and coffee creamer, and I was in line, and I got two cartons of eggs because they were 88 cents, and that's a pretty good deal for a carton of eggs. And I got in line and realized I only had enough money for one carton of eggs, or so I thought. And so I'm in line, and she's ringing me up, and I see this elderly black lady pull up behind me, and she's just got two cartons of eggs, and she's holding them tight. And I hear the Lord say, you buy that second carton of eggs, and you give them to her. So I ring up my eggs, and then I go, I want to get the second one as well. Because at first the lady said, do you want them? I said, no, I don't really need them. I thought I was broke. And I said, no, I don't really need them. You know, lying, because I didn't want to say I didn't bring enough money. And uh, she said, are you sure? And then I feel like the Lord said, uh, uh, buy the lady the eggs. And so I, I said, well, yeah, you can ring them up. And I kind of eyed the cash register and looked at my wallet and went, okay, we're good. And um, she, said, she said, okay, here you are, sir. And I said, ma'am, actually, can you give my, because you can only buy two cartons is the point. I said, can you give my other carton to this lady? And you should have saw her. She looked at me and went, and I said, thank you. And I just took off. I walked up the store. Here's why. Because, see, the fairway by my house, it's about four blocks away. That fairway is my personal mission field. That's where I shop at. And I didn't do it for her approval or her acceptance. But here's what I know. This woman has seen a witness of the love of Jesus as displayed by God's children. And so the next time I go in there, I'm going to say hi to her again. And the next time I go in there, I'm going to say hi to her again. And then at some point, I'm going to ask her her name. And does she have any children? And she's going to tell me them. And then I'm going to say, well, I have children too. How awesome is that? I'll, she's a little older, so they're probably about my age. And then I'll ask her discovery questions like how old are they? Where do they go to school at? And then she's going to say, what do you do? And then I'm going to get her. See how that works? Be because my heart was poked, my heart was provoked with compassion for that woman. Because by God's grace, I have the wherewithal to go, okay, God, I think you're up to something here. That, that's going to allow me an opportunity to engage that woman and probably her coworkers with the hope of the gospel. Because it's the everyday stuff of of life that God wants to use to make himself glorious.
I wonder if with this mindset, if the mundane could really become opportunities to minister to those around us. How many opportunities do we really have to engage others with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul doesn't, in there, Paul's not just provoked for no reason, but it says this, Paul walked through the city, and because he saw the idols in the city, Paul was provoked. I love that Paul's got this city vision. Paul looks at the city, and Paul goes, there's something wrong here. And so we all know this. If you're new, um, Hope City Church, we are a church in this city. We are a church of this city. Look around you. Look at the diversity of our church family, Hope City Church. That is amazing that because of Jesus, blacks and whites and old and young and rich and poor can all be in the room together. Because we're a church of this city. And when I say of this city, I mean everything from Washburn to Cedar Rapids and everything in between. Anything within the Cedar Valley, we are a church not only in this city, not only a church of this city, but we at Hope City, we're a church for this city. We exist to glorify God through making disciples who serve this city well. Because when we serve this city well, the city rejoices, the gospel is glorified, and this city will become a city of hope. The thing that provokes Paul is Paul sees the idols in the city. Those are the things that move Paul. They, they provoke Paul to cause him to reason with the people that were there. And I, I looked at the word because I... I like words, and so I look at the word reason. What did, that, what did that mean? Did it mean argue? Did he get a bullhorn and stand on a soapbox and preach at them? It, it doesn't mean any of that. It means Paul had a conversation with them. And I'm convinced that sometimes our approach to sharing the gospel has put more people off than the actual message itself. So what Paul does, Paul sees them worshiping these idols, and Paul gets provoked. And the reason he's provoked is because it's a city full of idols, which means it's a city that doesn't know it's God. That moves Paul, that, that motivates Paul, that idols in essence are created in the minds of men, crafted by the hands of men, and worshipped by the heart of men. An idol in Paul's day would have been a little wooden or stone statue that people bow down to. But here's the big idea, Hope City Church. The idols of our day are threefold, power, prestige, and pleasure. Those are three idols that all of humanity seems to like to bow down to. Power, prestige, and pleasure. Why do you say that? Because anything your life rises and falls on is the thing that you worship. Whatever motivates you, the first thought in the morning, the last thing you worry about at sleep is in essence the thing that has your attention, which means it's the thing that you worship. And my prayer for us and for my heart would be that, oh, the first thought in my morning would be, Jesus, my sweet Jesus, you've given me life and breath today and I love you. And it's not that glorious. It's usually more like, oh, I love you, Jesus. But my heart's doing that. And when I lay down at night, it, my prayer is that it would be, thank you for today. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for this city. I love you. Let's do it again tomorrow. Not thinking about all the meetings and appointments I've got to have before I go to sleep. So my mind's not on Jesus when I rest. Because here's the deal. Psalm 127 says this, that he gives his beloved sleep. It says, lest the Lord watch over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. Lest the Lord watch over or build the house, the builders build in vain. And this house, Hope City, your house, your home, I'm believing the Lord watches over you. Therefore, you can sleep well. Because here's the good news. He doesn't sleep. He's always on watch. He's always on watch. I love that Paul sees this crisis. He sees what's happening in the city, and it propels Paul to respond. And so let's look at a few verses and see what Paul did and glean some insights. Starting back at verse 18, Paul, it, he engages the people with the message of the gospel. In a, here's what he says. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others seem to be, excuse me, others, uh, excuse me, others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because Paul was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. 
The thing that I, I love here, what's happening is as I was reading through this and just saying, Lord, what would, you, what would you speak to us? What would you speak to my heart out of Paul's preaching? It's interesting. It, it, it lays out a few audiences. In the first audience, it says Paul preached to the Jews and to the devout people. And then it says and Paul preached to the people in the marketplace. And I said, well, Lord, really what's happening here? And here's what I feel like the Lord says. says Paul preached the gospel to the religious as well as to regular people. Paul preaches the gospel to, quote, unquote, Christians, if you were of that day, and he preaches the gospel to folks who don't, who don't know Jesus. So for us at Hope City Church, what that means is that we preach the gospel on Sunday morning, and our prayer is that we would equip you to share the gospel on Monday morning. Here's why. The gospel is for the maturity of the believer and not just the salvation of those who don't yet believe. The gospel and the depth of it, listen to me, for those of you who know and love Jesus, you will never exhaust the wonder of the cross. The depth, the wisdom, the kindness, the knowledge of God that's found in the cross of Christ. That God became man for you and was pierced and crushed under the hands of men that he might liberate men to become sons of God. The wonder of that. That you and I who were not once a people, who were aliens, who were far from God, who didn't know God. He, he, that God, the uncreated, the unseen God drew you to himself, put a robe on you, gave you a crown, called you a son and a daughter. He said, you're mine. I love you. And the world can never have you. The wonder of that. The delight of that, the liberation of that, the joy that I'm loved far more than I would ever know. And I'm sinful far more than I would ever know. Oh, but I'm loved far more than I would ever know. Oh, the, the anchoring of the soul that happens in the preaching of Jesus. We can never exhaust the wonder of it. So it's good news for the unbeliever. The person who doesn't know God, whose fate, according to the Bible, lies in hell without a saving knowledge of Jesus. Oh, but it's good news for the believer who makes it the anchor of their soul. It is very good news. I love that Paul preaches the gospel and the, the resurrection. Here's a, a thought to think through as I was looking through this. One, is it says this, that Paul went to the marketplace and he went to the synagogue to preach the gospel. The thing that I loved about Paul, and even as we were planning this church, one of my prayers was, Lord, reveal to me the watering holes in our city where people naturally gather together so that we can have the greatest impact on every individual. Paul knows, Paul knows where the people gather as individuals so he can have the greatest impact in their gatherings. The question would be, what are, what are your watering holes? Where are the places that people naturally gather? My son and I like to watch nature shows, and watering holes are always the best part in any National Geographic movie because, you know, something's about to get killed. <laughs> right? You got the gazelles. You got, you got the water buffalo. They just drinking the water. And before you know it, the little beady eye crocodile pops up. And he kind of looks around, you go, there he is. Then he goes back under. Because the watering hole is where everybody gathers. For me, it's the barber shop. Our barber, my barber's not here today. Uh, he goes to Hope City Church. His name's uh, um, uh, Kenneth uh, William. We call him K. Burt. And in that barber shop, it's a great gospel soil. Well, I, I get to talk about Jesus, and they call me Pastor Q, you know. And I'm kind of like, well, you can just call me Q. And they're, no, 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 you're a pastor. You're Pastor Q. And, and that, it creates great conversations about life and faith and politics and what's the meaning of life. And I've found and I'm finding, like Paul found, that God is always working. But here's the thing to catch and remember. When you share the gospel, you're going to get usually one of two responses. One response will be like them. Some people will reject the gospel and ridicule you. Who's this babbler? What is he talking about? Or the second response, like we see in Acts 17, is they will receive you and repent of their sin. But regardless of their response, we have the responsibility to share. Because the father said, hey, go tell your brother to come home. My son can't control the response of his sister. He's only tasked with being a faithful messenger. Okay? 
Paul, I think, shows us some things that we can learn that will help us share the gospel. And some things that I've learned throughout the years that I think have helped me engage people with the message of Jesus. The good news. It's good news of Jesus. Let's look at a few verses and then we'll, uh, I'll look and share from my outline. One of the, the things that we see, uh, starting at verse, tw- verse 22, it says, So Paul, standing in the midst, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. But rather, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. One of the things I see here that what, what Paul does that I've tried to do throughout the years when I'm sharing the hope of Jesus is I let the meeting, the meeting inform the means that I use to share the good news. What do you mean? I don't have four spiritual laws or I don't always use, for those of you who've been around for a little while, I don't necessarily use the Romans road to salvation. Who learned the Romans road to salvation? Who's from, see, that's how old it is. How, I didn't mean that because you're older. I just meant because no one knows how to use it anymore. <laughs> Some of y'all was like, what do you say? Um, uh, the <laughs> I let the meeting, the point is, I let the meeting determine the means I use. I let that inform me on how to share. So when I'm with someone, I let the natural conversation guide and lead the presentation of the gospel. So Paul here in Athens walks by, sees a statue, or sees a podium with no statue on it. And this, for those of you who like this theological terms, this is a term called contextualization. Contextualization. So Paul takes biblical truth, he, um, he kind of washes it out and puts it in everyday language. He goes, hmm, how do I teach them about the, um, about the self-existent, always existing God. How do I teach them about that? I don't know. See this podium that doesn't have anything there? They go, yeah. And like the thing that says God there, they go, yeah, let me tell you about that one. They go, oh, okay. Totally. I'm open to hearing that. So what Paul does is he contextualizes. He lets the meeting determine his method. So here's what I love that Paul does. One of the things that Paul does is that instead of Paul confronting the grotesqueness, or, or let me say it a different way. Paul first meets them where they are and moves them toward God. The first thing I've learned how to do when I'm talking to my friends or family members who don't know Jesus, I meet them where they are and then I move them toward God. I don't start with God. I start with where they are in their life. So if my family member says my marriage is in a rocky place, I start there. I go, it is, man, mine has been there too. And here's what I've found. I meet them where they are and then I move them toward God. God, the second thing that I've learned to do is to celebrate, like Paul does, God's goodness and not just the gravity of sin. Paul doesn't just go, here's all the sins that you committed and why you're not getting into heaven. And as Christians, for those of you who follow Jesus, we almost always start with sin and not God's goodness. We always start with, well, you know, that sin's going to get you in hell. No, them being a human is going to get them in hell. And because they're a human, sinning is what they do. But the good news is this, God loves us, and he has redeemed us. And the good news is only good because the bad news is, if you don't receive God's offer for salvation the way that he's made for you, the punishment remains. So one, Paul meets them where they are, moves them towards God. Two, Paul um, has this way, and I I think it's good, and I try to do it, of... um, uh, um, celebrating God's goodness and not just their sinfulness. The third thing Paul does is this. Um, I said it backwards, but Paul 
calls them into the story. Paul says, here's about this unknown God, and here's kind of what he did in the past, and he created a man, and out of that man he created humanity, and you're a part of God's story now, and if you're a part of our church and you went through the story of God, then you remember what we went through, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go online and listen to it again. So here's what I like to do when I share the gospel is this. I usually do three things. Start off with my story, share his story, and invite them to make it their story. I usually start off something like this, yeah, man, my whole life, I, I just, I was one of those guys who just didn't know God. I didn't grow up in a church home, and at 17 years old, I met Jesus, and, and that changed my life. And here's what the Bible teaches about Jesus, that, that God made humanity and that we walked away from God, but God is a good father, and he wasn't content with that. And so God sent his son to draw us back to himself so that we can have a relationship with him. And I'm telling you what, man, I, I don't know where you're at in life, but if you're in a place in life where you don't know God or you're in a tough spot and you think you might want to know who God is, then I'd encourage you to do what I did. And here's what I did. This is the fourth thing that you need to do when you share the gospel is give them a chance to respond. Give them a chance and be okay with the silence. So here's what I would do if I were you, you know. What I did one day, I said a prayer, Jesus Christ, I need you. Is that something you want to do today? Yeah, I think so. All right, we're here. Just repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus, I love you, I love you. I need you, I need you. Heal me, heal me. Feel me, feel me. Kill me, heal me. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> we're kind of. <laughs> Here's what I think Paul does, and here's, here's what I would say to you for those of you in the room who may or may not know Jesus in closing. I think Paul, at the end of the day, he answers the four most important questions that we could ever ask. And the, and the, first, one is, the first one is this. How did, I, how did I get here? How did I get here? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. How did you get here? Because at some point, you're going to land in the beginning, and either you're going to land in evolution or you're going to land in, in creation. And I think the world's too beautiful for it just to have had happen. The, the second question is, is this, and it should be on the screen, who am I? Who am I? Like, who are you? Like, your mom, okay, your kids grew up. You're a doctor. No, that's your profession. I'm a black man. No, that's your ethnicity. I'm 5'10". To 25, something like that. You know, what if my knees got cut off and I was only 14 and paleo works and I get back on the wagon because I fell off this week and I'm down to 200? Those are just the dimensions. Who are you? I'm Clavatus. No, that's your name. What if you changed it? Who are you? I've got good news. I know the answer. You are the son or daughter of your father. And if you're not home, he wants you home. It doesn't end there, though. Here's the next question. Most important question. One of the most important questions, at least. Why am I here? Why are you here? Like, why are you here? You have a purpose. You have a purpose more than to work, pay taxes, and die. You have a purpose. Oh, you have a purpose. And then the last one is this. Where am I going? When this is all said and done, there's one man who conquered death. The rest of us will suffer its sting. And then one day, we too will conquer death. Where are you going when this is all over? So I don't know where you're at today. Um, but, but here's what I would say. If you are a follower of Jesus already, Rejoice in this gospel. Engage others with, with this gospel. If you don't know Jesus, one of those four questions, you've already answered them, whether you know it or not. Maybe re-answer them in light of what was shared today. And if you already know you're in the room and you go, man, I, I need to, to re-answer some of those questions. Like, I, I don't know what would happen if I die. And honestly, I don't necessarily know why I'm here. Or, man, I know God and or I want to know God and I need someone to help me. You know, hey, Dad, will you bring one of my brothers to come lead me to you? What an honor that would be to do that today. As I close, let's, let's pray together. Let's have every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're here today and as I was talking, 
your, your, your thoughts were, man, I want to know Jesus or I want to get closer to Jesus. If that's you today and you know that you don't know Jesus the way that, that the Lord wants you to know Jesus, if that's you, and you go, cute today, I want a fresh start. I want a fresh start. Will you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. So I want a fresh start with Jesus. I want to start over. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. Just give me a few more seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I just feel like the Father says, come home. Yeah, just come home. I feel like the Lord says, I saw your heart before you ever raised your hand. Thank you for being sensitive to my voice. I want you to pray this prayer with me. The prayer isn't the main thing. The main thing is the person you're talking to, and it's Jesus, and he hears you, and he loves you. And I want my whole family to pray this prayer with me as they pray this prayer. Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying for me. I believe your death paid the cost for my sin. I'm coming home, Father, to be with you. The world behind me, the cross and Jesus in front of me. No turning back. Now, Father, I am asking for this, that you would bless and fill these ones today. The Lord says today is the day that you, my daughter, that you, my son, you came home. Today is the day will be remembered forever. Lord, I ask that you'd walk with them. God, I ask that you'd bring good, good Christian people around them. Help them take the next step. God, help it be easier to say no to the things that help them back. Help it to be easier to say yes to the things that please you. May they sense your presence in their heart today. Because that's where you are. Lord, I thank you for the marriages, the, 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 the husband and wife couples that raised their hand. Today, I, I just ask God and I thank you that their marriages will be stronger because of it. Father, I thank you for the single people that raised their hand today. Their future is so bright in you. But I thank you for the, the ones of us that will be me that have been hurting. I thank you that today I believe again, Lord. And I say thank you, you bring healing. Father, I ask that you'd fill them. Father, I ask that you'd draw them closer to yourself. I ask that you put them in a family that will love them and walk with them and help them grow. Father, I thank you for this church family. Thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So, so here's what I would like to do. If you're in the room today, and you raise your hand. I, I got to see you, and I'm going to pray for you and love on you. But I, wanna, I want not just me to love on you and pray for you, but if you're part of Hope City Church, I want to invite you to come up. If you're part of the team, and uh, I want you to come up. And if you're here and you prayed that prayer, please come on, let us pray for you love on you. And then two, um, if there are people here, specifically, I, I, I feel like the, the, um, the Lord's highlighting backs. If you're here and you've, you've got any kind of back spasm or a slip disc or herniated disc or you got a knot in your back, I think the Lord wants to heal you of that today. And so if that's you, you know that's you, I want to invite you to come up and let us pray for you. Hope City Church family, this is what we do. If you're a guest, here's the thing, a family that prays together stays together. So if you're here and you're a guest, this is what we do as a family. If you're family, come on up and get prayer. Uh, if not, I'll see you back here next Sunday. We're kicking off our new series called Stronger Marriages, Families, and Relationships. Get your kids, bring them in. God bless you. Come on up and get prayer. I'll see you next week. Amen. <laughs>